Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. And welcome to this conversation. My name is Simon Natrum. I'm a lecturer in economics at the University of the West Indies at Cave Hill. Uh, we have with us today an audience of students from the Cave Hill campus of the University of the West Indies. Today's topic that we're going to be discussing is the future of the Caribbean. And it is my unbelievable honor, really, to introduce today's featured guest, the Managing Director of the International Monetary Fund, Kristalina Georgieva. Ms. Georgieva holds a PhD in Economic Science and an MA in Political Economy and Sociology from the University of National and World Economy, Sofia, where she was also an Associate Professor until 1993. She began her career at the World Bank as an environmental economist in 1993 and eventually served as the CEO of the World Bank from 2017 to 2019. In between there, she served as European Commission Vice President for Budget and Human Resources and also as the Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Response. So Kristalina Georgieva has served as Managing Director of the IMF since October 2019, it turns out, elected just on the eve of the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, if you didn't know, she is the first managing director from an emer emerging market economy and only the second woman to lead the IMF. Please join me in welcoming our esteemed guests, not just to this event, but also to our beautiful shores, the managing director of the IMF, Ms. Kristalina Georgieva. So here in Barbados, uh, some of you will know, we have a culture of having intellectual debate in the many rum shops of the country. While there's no rum here today, at least not that I know about, I hope that we can have just as engaging and easygoing a conversation as we would have if we were uh, sat in a rum shop today. This morning, I'll begin uh, by just having a brief chat with the managing director, and then I will invite you uh, the students, the audience, to interact with her by posing your questions to her. Managing Director, we are honestly, truly very honored to have you here today and to have you join us uh, in this specific forum. I think this event and your visit as well uh, is truly representative of how the relationship between the IMF and the government of Barbados has changed dramatically in the last 30 years. Uh, and in fact, if my math is correct, I'm sure the older people in the room can tell me exactly if I'm right, but it is exactly 30 years since the Barbados last entered into a standby agreement with the International Monetary Fund in 92. I was a child at the time for sure. Maybe some of you in the room uh, hadn't been born as yet either. Now, when I was a student at the University of the West Indies, we learned of a strained relationship between your organization and our government. That appears to no longer be the case. Barbados and the IMF now work uh, you know, hand in hand. They seem to have a great working relationship. And I've certainly spent the last four years working together to put Barbados on a better footing, on a more sustainable footing, even throughout the pandemic. How do you feel about the work that the government of Barbados and the IMF have done together? And more importantly, uh, what do you think are the key elements that have brought about this truly dramatic shift? in the relationship between us. Uh, thank you very much for the uh, introduction. Uh, and my deepest gratitude to those in the room and those online for joining us uh, today. Uh, I am incredibly proud to be the first managing director to visit. And it is my first visit to Barbados. Uh, so uh, still learning, but I find it fascinating to be uh, here. Only when you see with your eyes, you understand that a small island can be very diverse and it may be very densely populated on one side and almost practically empty on another for basically environmental reasons. Uh, something that I, as, as you mentioned, I have uh, some background uh, for. So uh, you ask a very good question. How come some 30 years ago, relations between the IMF and Barbados were difficult, and now they're very productive, and actually we learn from Barbados to pass experience 
to our engagements with other countries. Uh, and I believe there are three reasons for that. The first reason is uh, how the IMF has changed over time. Um, I can simply say, this ain't your grandmother's IMF. <laughs> um, we, we were, org we were a, always a very competent organization, and we are a very competent organization. But over time, uh, we learned that a deeper engagement with countries is necessary to have programs that are owned by the countries, uh, that we define how we go forward together. Uh, and I want to praise my uh, predecessor also, Christine Lagarde, who has made a significant contribution to building this IMF that is with a heart and a courage, uh, sorry, with a head and a courage and a heart. And that is uh, a significant difference in, in engaging with countries uh, with much more uh, ability to listen to each other. The second reason is um, the um, uh, more comprehensive approach we take towards our main well-defined mandate. So what is the mandate of the IMF? Macroeconomic and financial stability, growth and employment. We now understand that only a comprehensive approach that takes into account not just narrow economic and financial factors, but takes into account people, investing in education and health and social protection, takes into account our planet, the risks of climate change to macroeconomic and financial stability. So that is a significant uh, advancement in the way my colleagues at the IMF approach our mandate. The third reason is for the women in this room that your government is led by a woman and so is IMF. <laughs> and I'm saying this actually seriously. I think that in the world we live uh, in, we do need gender diversity everywhere, and we did it at the senior uh, levels. Uh, not because governments led by men and organization led by men would be less competent. They're very competent, but we need this ability to bring all perspectives. And one thing women bring, as you know very well, is more consensus-oriented attitude and much deeper care for the vulnerabilities in society, for the children, for the elderly. I saw it yesterday uh, in our trip around uh, Barbados with uh, uh, Prime Minister Motley. I, I looked at Barbados through her eyes, and this is a caring person who actually very deeply lives through the struggles of, of this uh, nation. So let me, let me uh, bring um, to closure my, my, my answer to your question by saying the following. We live in a more shock-prone world. The world I grew up in that was slow-moving, slow-changing, more peaceful, with only one-third of the population we have today in this planet, and a world that did not experience at that time the risks of climate change. Uh, this world is in my memories, but it is not the world my daughter and my gran granddaughter live in. So in a more shock-prone world, our main preoccupation, whenever we are, whether we are heads of organizations, of governments, or a family, has to be building resilience to these shocks. And how do we build resilience to shocks? Uh, you in Barbados 
are a um, textbook on that. Access to education and prioritize education. And it was so rewarding to see the young kids with their different uniforms coming from different uh, schools on the street. Access to health services and a social protection uh, under your feet. Um, a resilient economy in which uh, we actually do build buffers. Part of our job at the IMF is to, to be concerned about that. Uh, is the budget sound enough to respond to a shock when it comes? Uh, and of course, uh, a more resilient nature, more care about our uh, natural environment, our, our waters and our, you know, the seas that surround us, the land we live on, uh, the air we breathe. And that resilience building, everybody has a role to, pay, to play. We at the fund, we have our role. What is it? Integrate this into macro policy advice and then make sure that our financing, our programs are aligned with that advice. Uh, very successful program in Barbados, IMF program. Why is it successful? Uh, Mia Motley spoke about that. Because it is adaptable to changing circumstances. So the pandemic shock comes, we walk back our requirements on fiscal uh, provision. So we say, <laughs> look, you have to spend because the economy is in standstill. And then understanding that as the economy improves, building buffers, fiscal buffers becomes possible. Now we are experiencing a second shock from the war in Ukraine. We have to adapt uh, to it. And uh, I look around the room, what I see, resilient people. Thank you. Thank you very much, Managing Director. Uh, that is, I think, a perfect answer and a very comprehensive answer. And there's so many things in there that uh, I think we can pull and we can talk about. The one that I really want to get into, uh, and you know, I sort of referenced my own time as a student at the University of the West Indies. Um, I personally got into economics because of the big shock that was happening at that time. That was the global financial crisis. And you know that, that felt big to me at the time. In retrospect, maybe not, because today our students seem to be facing even bigger challenges. Uh, and you know, some of them existential almost. When I was their age, someone suggested to me that I sort of uh, don't worry about trying to fix the problems that previous generations had caused, that you know, I, I let those previous generations fix their own problems. Um, but today's challenges seem so big and so urgent. Can we really afford to ask our young people to sit on the sidelines? Uh, what should we expect of them, these young people sitting in our rooms? And I suppose, what should they expect of us as well? Uh, well, certainly no one can sit on the sideline. Why? Because we do face an existential threat. And here in Barbados, you witness it. And it is the threat of our changing climate. And we do need to act decisively both to reduce the magnitude of this threat, and that applies to everybody although large emitters are those that would define how successful we are. I was impressed to see the um, uh, rooftop solar, solar in Barbados. I know we are, you're talking about wind. You have plenty of it. Uh, everybody has to do their part. But where the critical answer would come uh, from is China, India, Europe, the United States, the large economies that are the largest contributors uh, to CO2 emissions. And uh, at the IMF, we have a very important message. If you add your voice as young people to this message, 
I would be extremely grateful. And it is tax pollution, don't tax people. Tax CO2 emissions, make sure that there is a price assigned with emitting them, whether it is a tax or it is a, a trade or it is a regulatory enforcement is less significant. What is significant is that we have to send a very clear signal to producers and to consumers that we simply cannot survive as humanity unless we change. Uh, we also have to be adapting to the uh, uh, changes in the climate. I mean, it's no more a problem of the future. It's right here with us. And again, I saw here some of the adaptation uh, measures uh, that are being taken. And I cannot think of a better voice on this existential crisis than yours, because you are going to inherit the problems my generation uh, created. So press us, but also act on your uh, own. Set up the example that you care. And that is so powerful that I cannot, I cannot even describe to you what it means to me when my 11 years granddaughter comes and tells me, well, um, are you sure that it is a good idea to go around and around in a car for a whole day, isn't that bad for our planet? That's bad for our planet. By the way, I drive an electric car, which is not entirely uh, free of, of impact, but it is a lower, lower impact. Um, uh, and my granddaughter approves. So uh, to, I want to take another problem for you to help the world deal with. And it is making sure that we stay together as a global community. Please add your voices to, we are interdependent. We need each other. We cannot possibly break into blocks and then operate within these blocks alone. Uh, that is simply not possible. You have a war in Ukraine and it means, I understand, 20% increase in food prices in Barbados. And in Africa, it means kids dying from hunger. So to solve problems, we must build that sense of solidarity and build the trust that is the underpinning foundation of solidarity. Uh, I very often hear angry voices and yes, anger is a good thing. It kind of puts a problem on, on the screen. But I dream for a world in which what we do is empathy for each other, reaching out for each other, and bring to the world more of this. More love, less hate. You, you can do that. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to surprise you. I'm uh, in your eyes. I mean, you, you talk about yourself being uh, elderly. <laughs> Makes me feel so, <laughs> so not well. But uh, so I'll surprise you. I like very much uh, uh, Rihanna. She's one of my favorites. So when I was, I, I was pumping myself up to meet you, so I put one of her songs. And it is very appropriate. SOS, have you listened to it? What does she say there? I am the problem. You, of course, are the answer. You are the answer. So think of yourself as the most powerful force and use your voice. Thank you so much. That is, uh, I think, a, a, a wonderfully uh, powerful moment for me now to turn to you guys and say, in a few minutes, I will. Uh, allow you to ask your own questions uh, to Kristalina, um, and you can raise your hand, and uh, at the prescribed moment, I'll call on you uh, and allow you to go to the mic and ask your own questions. So actually, let me now turn to the youth as well, because we have 
uh, some students who asked a couple questions online. And one of them sort of specifically asks about something that I think is, is uh, quite near and dear to your own heart. And the question reads, how best can multilateral development banks and the IMF support small island developing countries in mobilizing innovative finance to accelerate the adoption of clean technology and achieve development outcomes? Uh, great question. Thank you very much for it. Uh, at the IMF, we are working on, in the answer to this question on three fronts. First, very important, we created a new financial instrument called Resilience and Sustainability Trust. The objective of this Resilience and Sustainability Trust is to support policies in countries that would put them on a structural transformation path specifically addressing the climate challenge, but also pandemic preparedness, you know, food, food security would fall in that same category. What is the innovation here? And it is uh, uh, to a great degree, degree uh, thanks to uh, Mia Motley. The innovation is that we provide concessional finance on the basis of vulnerability, not income per capita. Traditionally, and still this is the case in development banks, the only criteria for concessional finance, in other words, better terms of finance, is income per capita. A poor country would have access, middle income countries, country won't. Never mind that Barbados is a middle income country faced with tremendous climate challenges. So, the innovation we, we, we put in place is twofold. One, access to vulnerable countries, to concessional finance. Two, long-term provision of finance, 20 years maturity, 10 years grace. This is twice as long as the longest we have at the IMF. Uh, and uh, uh, we work with the, with the other development uh, banks to think about other ways which takes me to my second point. We are, uh, we, we are going to come in about maybe two weeks uh, with a uh, policy analysis on how to move more private sector finance to emerging markets and developing countries for climate action. Uh, and we are looking into reducing, primarily reducing real and perceived risk. Why is this critical? Because if private finance only continues to go to where risks are lower, Germany, France, the United States, that's good, but we are cooked. <laughs> Why? Because emissions are growing in emerging markets, but money is going to advanced economies. We have to shift the direction of finance to go where it would make the biggest difference. And that particularly applies to also adaptation to climate risks. So that is the second area of innovation. And the third is actually very neat. Uh, Jerry Rice uh, here, uh, our director for communications, uh, was a partner in that. We put in place a um, climate change challenge. So we turn to you and we say, bring your ideas we would have a uh, eminent uh, panel to review them, and then we would put the five top to work. Because we have to open up space for all ideas to, to flourish. It's like a thousand, thousand flowers blooming, but then we want to be able to make a nice bouquet, because if you have the flowers <laughs> and they just bloom and, 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 and disappear, that it is not helpful. So we want to be also a laboratory for ideas to turn into, into action. Okay, that is, that is brilliant. That's a, a, an especially, I think, important innovation for us uh, in the Caribbean. Um, and I think it's especially important because these young people that sit before you today are unique. Um, 
in that they are from some of the most vulnerable yep. places in the world. And they are part of a generation that will suffer the most from the harms of climate change. Uh, and so, you know, their burdens are vast, but it turns out so too are their opportunities to make social and physical change. And, and speaking of social and physical change, there's, uh, you know, one change that I wanted to talk about. It's something you mentioned earlier, and, uh, and it really stuck with me. Uh, now, uh, the University of the West Indies is certainly very proud of its uh, Institute for Gender and Development Studies. Um, uh, I happen to know a bit of the data, and I know that a 2016 survey that was done found that women in Barbados achieve uh, higher rates of tertiary education than men at essentially all ages, but especially uh, by a long way uh, at young ages. Uh, and yet there remain inequalities and barriers to women in Barbados at all levels. Unfortunately, especially in economics. Um, we are proud to have our first uh, woman as a prime minister. Uh, we have our second managing director, who's a woman. Uh, and you know these things are fantastic. But um, we still need to create sustainable change in the systems that produce these inequalities. How do these young men and women make those sustainable changes in the system that produce yep. gender inequalities? Well, the uh, first and, and most important step, of course, is to eliminate discrimination that is uh, grounded in laws. Uh, the World Bank publishes um, a uh, survey called Women, Business and the Law, and it shows legal barriers to women and who are the champions in having eliminated these legal barriers. Uh, and I can tell you that there is still quite a lot that needs to be done just to eliminate obstacles that are embedded in constitutions or in laws in uh, countries. Uh, the most uh, dramatic, uh, of course, is um, access to opportunities. Uh, women traditionally would have harder time to get access to finance. Uh, they would have harder time uh, to uh, build a track record in business. In other words, more is expected from them. Here is a simple fact. I don't know the story of uh, Barbados, but I know it for Africa as a whole. Not you know your part of the world, but very close. You know, just across the uh, ocean. Uh, in Africa, it is proven that women are better entrepreneurs than men, proven by all the indicators for performance. But men have six times more access to finance than women. So you shoot yourself in the foot. You, you act, this is bad for, for women, it is bad for men, it is bad for everybody. Uh, the second hugely important step, if you eliminate these barriers, is that then to make sure that laws are actually implemented. And uh, uh, the third, and, I, and it may be the most important one, is uh, uh, power in uh, quantities. Uh, when you have only a couple of women, it's hard. But when you have more women, critical mass of women, it changes the conversation, makes for better decisions. So here it is, I take pride, I am the second woman uh, at the helm. I take even more pride that as of this year, of the five people at the top of the IMF, three are women. That has never happened before. The number one, the number two, and the number three at the fund. But even more important is women at the level of our directors. Uh, when I started, we had 25% women. We are now close to 40%. Uh, and then when you have this critical mass, they mentor younger women. And then what, what is so impressive is that majority of men actually want more women. Why? Because women are good workers. I, uh, when I was uh, in my early days at the World Bank, we had a uh, great president, Jim Wolfenson, and at that time, very few women. So he's talking to me, we had a massive problem to solve, and he says, Kristalina, Kristalina, so much work to do and so very few women to do it. So uh, it, is, it is possible and it is getting 
done, but we are not quite there yet. Okay. Now I want to hear from the students. Um, does, if anyone has a question they'd like to ask, uh, now is the moment where you can raise your hand uh, and uh, jump to the mic and you can have your time with uh, the managing director of the IMF. Uh, so there's one hand here and I will ask uh, you to just come to the mic uh, once you do. So please introduce yourself um, and uh, uh, you can let Kristalina know what you're studying as well. Hi, it's on. Oh, hi, good morning. Um, my name is Tia Greenwich. I am actually just completed my master's in financial management. Great. Okay, so my question for you, Kristalina. We all know that the COVID-19 pandemic, it has had a significant impact on the level of foreign direct investment. <clears throat> UNTAD's World Investment Report in 2021 mentioned that foreign direct investment declined by more than a third to one trillion, mm -hmm. threatening the progress made in sustainable development. So my question to you is, what, if any, are the plans of the IMF to assist mm -hmm. their member countries to not only recover from the setback of sustainable development due to COVID, but to propel these countries to pre-COVID levels and beyond? Mm -hmm. uh, excellent question, thank you. Uh, the, uh, the IMF, uh, has stepped up significantly from the very outset of the COVID crisis. We have provided financing to nearly 100, 100 of our members. This is, we have 190 members. And uh, for those in, in most difficult uh, situation, we provided emergency financing, including to uh, Barbados. Uh, we also recognized early that uh, a liquidity shortage would hit emerging markets in developing countries. We have an instrument, not a perfect one, but we have it called special drawing rights. So we uh, distributed last August $650 billion uh, equivalent of special drawing rights to all our members. And then we realized that some of our members are in a strong position. They got these SDRs, but they don't really need it. So we, st we started a very important program of on lending from countries that got it, don't need it, through the fund, including through the Resilience and Sustainability Trust to countries that need it. So direct injection of uh, support. But your question touches a, a, a broader issue, which is the withdrawal of um, invest, investments from emerging markets. Uh, last year, it, in 2020, there was a short period of time when that was really a threat. But then because of highly accommodative conditions, in other words, very low interest rates, the flow of private capital to emerging markets remained fairly steady. Where we are today is a very dangerous zone. Why? Because uh, multiple factors, supply ch chain interruptions, the war in Ukraine, are putting pressure on prices. And therefore, inflation is becoming the most pressing concern in many, many countries. We need inflation under control because price stability is critical for growth. But to bring inflation under control, that means tightening of financial conditions. And when this happens, typically we see withdrawal of capital. So at the IMF now we are working hard to anticipate which of our members may face balance of payment uh, constraints, and I can tell you we are ready to step up. We have 700 billion lending capacity, and we would deploy as much as necessary. And actually, I tell our members that are with high level of debt, don't wait. Don't wait. Move towards uh, uh, programs uh, that would help you protect your economy, because if when capital leaves, and nothing comes, 
to, to guarantee uh, stability, uh, then countries may find themselves in a very, very tough uh, spot. Uh, but I want to be very uh, honest with all of you. We are for some tough time this year, next year, because of this tightening of financial conditions and the consequences of it. Don't take it as bad because we need financial stability and we need price stability. So investment, investors would feel comfortable to invest. Uh, there would be jobs, there would be growth. Uh, so we have to go through this uh, tougher, tougher time. Uh, and uh, your prime minister very wisely was turning to the nation saying, look, change your behavior. If you can reduce uh, uh, travel single person in a car, you know, ride share, do it. If you have a garden, pay attention to it, water it, because we all, we need to all uh, adjust to this uh, tougher, tougher time. Uh, that's... And, and let me just say one thing. The very best service we do to countries is to help them have prudent macroeconomic management, because then investors trust that this is a good place to put money in. Thank you so much. Uh, I think there was another question here, and I will uh, let another student um, have their, their opportunity. Uh, remember to just introduce yourself. Hi, good morning. My name is Keisha Blades. Um, I'm a final year econ and finance student from Cave Hill. Um, and my question this morning, oh yeah, welcome. My question this morning, uh, so basically, Barbados, like most of the Caribbean islands, is at high risk of being uh, affected by food security. And this is pretty much due to our heavy reliance on food imports. So this is likely to worsen due to our current inflation surge. As Barbados continues to recover from the pandemic, uh, what measures can our government specifically do to protect the well-being of the poorest and the most vulnerable? Uh, well, the, the, um, it is very, very important to recognize that everybody is affected, but the most vulnerable people are uh, in an incredibly tough spot. When 40, 50 percent of your income goes for food and uh, fuel, and prices jump, they double, that's a catastrophe. Um, in this uh, environment, we also see middle class uh, quite affected. So measures do need to target the most vulnerable. There has to be also some appreciation for the uh, impact on those that are above the poverty line, but not by much. Uh, what we see, what we recommend, and what we see being in place uh, is a recognition of inequalities having grown during the pandemic. That goes back to also the first question. That cannot continue because uh, it undermines the uh, social foundation. Uh, and uh, in that sense, measures that are directed to more progressivity in taxation, so those who can afford to help more, they do. Um, we, s we see in some countries, and, and I, see, I see this as a, as a positive, uh, uh, windfall uh, taxes. Some particular sectors actually benefited from, from the pandemic, and that is appropriate to share some of this benefit with those who were negatively impacted uh, by it. Uh, very important question on food security. It is actually the right moment to think about more investment in agriculture and especially in, agri in resilient agriculture and in agricultural productivity. When I drove around the island, I saw that some of it is uh, being done. I can see uh, more uh, land being uh, utilized for uh, food production. Uh, and I am, I, am, I am on the view that um, in a world of more frequent shocks that interrupt supplies, uh, that attention to food security does have a domestic component. 
uh, when we were driving to here, my colleague uh, told me that um, during the pandemic, sandals would import white fish, sandals in the Caribbean would import white fish from China because of interruption of domestic uh, supply. So thinking about the resilience of domestic production, uh, the, uh, the, the ability to project for the future a more um, a balanced way of how we feed people, especially in a world of changing climate, do we really want to transport all this food with the um, carbon footprint of that uh, uh, from here to somewhere else and, and vice versa. So uh, that is that rethinking of supply chains, rethinking of security of supply um, uh, is, is appropriate, especially for food. Remember the old economic uh, textbooks would say cost is your factor determining where production takes place. Where, whenever it is cheaper, this is where it takes place. We can't have that concept anymore. Uh, there has to be also this element of security, security of supply, uh, integrated in the way we think about economic efficiency. Uh, doesn't mean to go to the extreme and say, oh, we would produce everything here in Barbados. Not possible to begin with. But having more, more of a... Um, supply chain logic that, that builds this resilience, this security in it, uh, is just uh, uh, a necessity. <laughs> I told my family in Bulgaria, we have some land, and I, I told them when I was young, we were growing things on this land. My mother and I would go and we have tomatoes and cucumbers and uh, uh, berries. Uh, and now it is just a place for enjoyment. And I said, well, you know, maybe you want to think about it. Maybe, maybe not a bad idea to return to this uh, uh, good old habits. Well, that's certainly uh, food for thought for all of us. Uh, I think we are unfortunately uh, just out of time. Um, I do have, I uh, just want to, to, to pitch one final uh, question to you. Um, just that these young people that sit before you uh, are the future of the Caribbean. Um, you know, I've had the honor of trying to share my knowledge with them and inspire them. Um, but we need world changers at this moment in time, and uh, we need them to be world changers. No pressure, guys. Um, uh, you, Kristalina, uh, certainly are a world changer. For those in this room uh, who want to make an impact on this world and who truly want to make it a better place. Uh, what final piece of advice would you leave with them? Well, the, the, the most important source of strength is you. Believe in yourself. Uh, in my life when I was younger, very often I would doubt, am I the right person for this job? Don't. Step up, it's... Uh, you <laughs> that defines your destiny. And uh, the one thing I learned, I learned it actually early in life uh, from my father. When I would go to him doubtful about decision I should take. Should I do this? Should I do that? My father always had the same answer to me. Do the right thing. So when, when in any, even now at the front, and my colleagues would vouch for that, we have discussion on very tough issues. I always want us to be guided by what is the right thing to do for people. And um, when you get to this simple question, you will get an answer. And uh, uh, I'm sure you will excel in taking this answer forward. Thank you very much, Kristalina. I have really enjoyed this conversation for sure. And I know our students have relished the opportunity, the rare opportunity, um, to have a chat with um, the head of one of the world's foremost economic institutions. Um, on behalf of all of us here, I'll say that I hope, uh, we hope that you enjoy your time in Barbados. 
and thank you for taking time out of your super busy schedule uh, to be here with us in this forum. To those of you in attendance, both here in person and online, uh, we hope that you've been inspired and invigorated by today's events, and we thank you for joining. Uh, good day, everyone. Thank you all very much. Uh, I should say, remember that sometime doing the right thing, others would tell you this is impossible. Do it, nonetheless. Uh, so thank you all very much. It was fantastic to be with you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just before uh, the students run, if anyone wants to snap a picture with uh, the MD, absolutely feel free to do so. I'm sure she will be... A collective selfie sounds wonderful. <laughs>